Celebrate Recovery helps people because it gives them, they see there's hope. And this can be such a relief and a release of being able to share in a safe community what has gone on for them that's been so hard. It becomes obvious when you attend that you're surrounded by people who are saying and advertising, yeah, I have a problem and everyone around me has a problem. And somehow that makes it really safe and really relaxing. And over time, you see people change. You hear it in their sharing. People show you how you change. The jail ministry is a ministry where we go into the Monterey County Jail for women. We're allowed to come in and uh, have church, you know, with them, yeah. You know, it's a very dark place and there's a lot of needs. And uh, one girl said, when you girls come in here and minister, it's like a ray of sunshine come into the cell. And, and, and we walk out of here with, with hope. I would tell them, we're praying for you. And there's people that are praying for you. So don't feel alone. That really ministers to them. I realized, oh my gosh, I have tried my whole life to change things out there that I can't change. And the only person that I can change with God is me. And so that's where, that was my big aha moment. And that's where I knew that I needed this in a desperate, deep way. And that's what we do in Celebrate Recovery is we let the Holy Spirit bring up the thing that God loves us too much to let us continue doing. We throw the seed and uh, some of them, maybe they'll catch it, maybe some of them won't. We don't know, but it's the seed was sown and it's up to the Lord. But uh, I tell you, it is a wonderful, wonderful ministry. And I'm so glad I, I joined. I could safely say this, that everybody in this room and everybody online watching has had a time of confusion in their life, a time of being troubled, a time of wondering what's next, what to do, and then trying to figure that out and navigate it. We're going to talk about how that works this morning when it happens in the life of a believer. How do we continue to be ignited and to follow Jesus and, and still continue to be discipled? How do we do that? Last week, Pastor Kevin gave an excellent message on the passion of Peter and how Peter in his passion still stumbled and, you know, fumbled things and did all that, but it never stopped his passion for following Jesus. So what do we do as believers? If we have a time of confusion and uh, great trouble in our lives, how do we continue to be discipled and follow Jesus? How do we continue to be launched in that direction? So we're going to talk about now how we follow in times of confusion. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me or your Bible app. We're going to read from God's Word in the Gospel of Luke. We're starting with chapter 1, verses 26 through 35, and then 46 through 55. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting could this be? But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. And I'm going to point out we read over and over again, Old Testament through New, how many times different people say, do not be afraid. And now it's Mary, or the, um, the angel saying to Mary, do not be afraid. So you have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth, give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? asked the 
Mary asked. The angel said, I am a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And then Mary said, and this is called Mary's Song of Praise, what I'm about to read. She said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior for he has been mindful of the humble state of this servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From, and this fear means respect him deeply. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. So Gabriel had appeared before, about 500 years before he appeared to Daniel in the Old Testament. And he did the same thing there that he did with Mary here. He brought a message from God. And we know that Mary was greatly troubled and wondered because there's no evidence that Mary was trying to see an angel, trying to have one appear, working on angel appearances or anything. It just came out of nowhere. She was troubled and confused. And in the world of psych, psychology, we call that at times, in this time, cognitive dissonance. You may have heard the phrase. Cognitive means thinking, in your thinking. And it's dissonant. It doesn't hit the right note. It doesn't fit. So the American Psychological Association defines this as an unpleasant psychological state resulting from inconsistency between two or more elements in a cognitive system. And what it really means, it's saying this. You're going along thinking everything's going this way. I have plans. This is what I know is going to happen today, tomorrow, next week, you know, within reason. And we're going forward and we're checking the boxes and it's working. And something comes out of nowhere and shifts it and changes it. And you're stunned. You're stopped, troubled, confused. And you're wondering. And what we do then is we have to try to make sense out of it. We try, have to try to navigate it. And often what people do is reject the message, the new variable. They reject it, downplay it, explain it away turn away from it. There's all kinds of human options that we do, and it's normal to do that. But for Mary, she was very different, like, like us, what we aspire to be. She was a devout follower of the Lord. So here's Mary in this, this cognitive dissonance, this troubled moment where she's, she's like, what? What is going on? And yet, because she was a devout follower of the Lord, it changed how she moved forward. And Mary made a choice right then. Her way to cope was to submit and trust. Did you ever think of it this way? I, I hadn't until I walked through this. Mary was free to say no. Mary was free to say, I'm not doing it. Mary was free to say, I don't want any part of it. Mary was free to ignore the lesson. God never takes away our free will, our ability to make choices. So I ran across a quote from an old-time pastor and author passed away almost 100 years ago, Samuel Chadwick, and he explained it nicely, I thought. He said this, confusion and impotence are the inevitable results when the wisdom and the resources of the world are substituted for the presence and power of the Spirit. What he's saying then is if we're in that time where I'm confused, I don't know what's going on. What do I do next? What do I say, not say? How do I proceed? If I rely on wisdom of the world and resources of the world, I'm going to end up remaining confused and powerless. I believe that to be quite true. So let's dig into the context here, a little bit about what's going on with Mary and Joseph and when the angel comes and, and to help us know what's, what she's really doing. So Nazareth was a small town, not revered, not 
close to the size of Jerusalem, nothing like that. It's out of the way. I've been there a couple of times. You go there to tour things, but it's not really on the way anywhere. And also, Mary and Joseph were not yet married. They were betrothed. Betrothal then didn't work the way it works now. Now it's kind of like you decide whatever you want it to be. But back then, it was fairly set and determined by the culture. You were betrothed either by choosing each other or families arranging it. And the betrothal would last at least a year. And it was a chance for the community to get to know you as a couple, for you to get to see how the community reacted to you as a couple. And there was absolutely no sexual intimacy permitted. And it was so serious that if the betrothal was broken, you would need a legal process to happen. It was just a step under a divorce. So Mary and Joseph are betrothed. And here's what I'm thinking, and it doesn't say it there, but it seems common sense. They had to have some plans, right? Well, we're going to be together. Where are we going to live? We're going to have kids. I wonder what they'll look like. You know, Joseph worked with his hands. Maybe she was asking him already, you're going to remodel the kitchen, right, if we buy a place? I don't know. But they had plans. They had to have had some form of plans. And highly favored, as we read in the verses there, really in this context refers to God's glorious, wonderful grace. And it was not given to Mary because she was somehow special apart from others. And it's easy to look at that and see that, but that's not what was happening. Instead, it was given in a way, hear this, exactly the way it's given to you and I. Everyone in the room, everyone online, if you're a follower of Jesus, that glorious grace is given to you. And what does it mean? It means that Mary didn't merit this visit from Gabriel. She didn't earn it. She, wasn't, she didn't achieve a degree. She wasn't accomplished and known far and wide. She was just, they were blue-collar kids from a small town, just regular people. And he chose to give her his glorious grace. And he chooses to give us that when we accept Christ as our Savior. We need to see that connection. Mary was greatly troubled, as I mentioned, and had cognitive dissonance. And then also, she's instructed to name the baby Jesus. Why Jesus? Well, it was a name commonly found in those times. But when you break down the word Jesus in the Hebrew, you find within the definition, the word saves. So it was precise and strategic. It was exactly the right name. And then we read the promise of she would be overshadowed. Overshadowed. And what does that mean? It, it carries a sense of the consistent and ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And I wanted to point out to you, did you know that Scripture points out that that overshadowing is for all of us. It's for all of us, meaning the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Let me read some, some scripture to kind of cement this and support it. Back in the book of Isaiah, some 700 years before this time of Mary being visited by the angel, we read in chapter 41 these words. So do not fear. There it is again. Do not fear. We get consistently reassured throughout Scripture, do not fear. It's going to work out. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, we can look at that and we can think, well, that was, you know, God talking to Isaiah way back then, 700 years ago. What's it have to do with me? Well, everything in this book was commanded by God to be in this book. If it was just for Isaiah, what's the point of writing it down for the future believers to read? The point is, it is for us right now, right here. We can put ourselves in Isaiah's place. Then Paul says in Romans chapter 8, and this, this will ring sweet for a lot of you who have these as life verses. For I am convinced 
that neither death nor life, neither height nor depth, not anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what he's saying there is when we receive Christ as our Savior and the overshadowing is there and the presence of the Holy Spirit is there, we're like this with him. And there's times in life where maybe we don't sense the closeness or we, we have feelings like maybe it's not here the way I'd like it to be. But we know in truth, in reality, it's still there. He is still there. That's really important. And then I liken the words of Jesus himself in John chapter 14. And in 14 in John, Jesus is getting ready to be arrested under false charges, go through a mock trial and be tortured, crucified, executed, killed, buried, and he's going to rise again. But before he goes, he has words for his followers. And he says this, if you love me, you will obey what I command. He knows he's leaving. Physically, he's leaving. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. What does that mean? The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. Here's what the word world means in that context. It means those who don't yet know Christ as their savior. They're in the world. Remember with the world's wisdom and resources, that's where they are. There's many who've not yet received Jesus. And so for them, for them, they won't see him and they won't know him when he comes. But Jesus concludes this passage with, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. And that is way past a feeling. That is reality. That is truth. And so in my preparation, I ran across a, a comment in the Expositor's Bible commentary that really resonated with me. And this is about Mary and, the, and what, what, what she was like when she submitted and trusted this unbelievable message from an angel. It says, her, Mary's servanthood, is not a cringing slavery, but a submission to God that in Old Testament times characterized believers, genuine believers, and that should characterize believers today. Mary's trusting submission at this point in her life may be compared with her attitude toward her son later on in John 2, verse 5, where she directs people to obey him at the wedding. You might recall the first gospel account of a miracle is Jesus at the wedding, and disaster strikes, meaning the wine's gone. So they come to him, and he goes, all right, bring me some water. And they're going, okay, you say so. And then people look to Mary. She's there. Say, what should we do? And she says, do what he says. She's never stopped knowing who he is and following him. And once his ministry started, she's all in. She's all in. See, Mary's life changed radically when the angel Gabriel came. And it was never the same. And that's true for many of us. What does it mean radically? Well, for me, maybe for you. When I accepted Christ, everything seemed different. I filtered differently. I saw different things. I interpreted things differently. People saw me differently. Everything changes. Mary's life had changed. She had literally stopped the life before and launched in a whole new way. So that's important for us to know. So now what do we learn from this? What do we learn from the past, our past, before knowing Jesus? What can we look to in Mary's story and know that she learned? What are the challenges that come at us through this? Well, first, we are God's workmanship or handiwork or masterpiece, depending on your Bible translation, created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. What that means is if you're here and you know the Lord, you're not done. I had a good friend in Pleasanton she was in our office up there, our counseling office, and she stopped playing the organ. 
at her church. She, goes, she said, I've done my time. I've retired from all that. And I said, how do you retire from serving Jesus? Really? You just punch out, get your pension and golf? I mean, what do you do? It was mystifying to me. Ephesians 2.10 is where we find this. If you're here, if you're a follower of Christ, you're not done. You're never done until you're with him. Never. It's like the kingdom isn't finished, right? So next, when God presents our opportunities, we may be troubled and have confusion. Like, I, I had an idea about, I thought what would happen, but this isn't in there. I, this came out of nowhere. I'm confused. I don't know what's going on. That could be us when the opportunities come. Next, we are called as believers to submit as Mary did. That wasn't a one-off. Well, then she had to, but I don't. We're, we're the same place. We have to submit and trust. And next, number four, we're living under God's, oh, his overshadow, but I call it overwatch because I've seen too many, you know, action movies covered by the grace of Jesus. But in Overwatch, the team goes in, but there's always someone in Overwatch, right? They're up there communicating, warning, taking care of, watching out for, and I think that's what the overshadowing is in our lives. We're never alone, abandoned, on our own. Never. He's with us. He's warning us. He's caring for us. He's fellowshipping with us. He's guiding us and directing us to the best, ultimate good, his good. And five, you may be in a similar situation as Mary. Maybe something has already happened. Maybe it's going to happen. Maybe it did recently where you thought everything was going this way and boom, out of nowhere, something derailed your plans. That could easily happen. And six, and this isn't any knock against anyone, but I would say most of us live average common lives. Within our culture, Western culture, we live average common lives. As Mary and Joseph we're doing. And next, the call to follow him may be something you're already doing. I don't want anyone here to, to think that I'm saying, whatever you're doing, stop it because of something new and radical is coming. That's not true. If you've already felt prompted, nudged, and drawn in and called to serve the Lord in a certain way, we rejoice with you. Hallelujah. It's Great kingdom work. However, his call to follow may be radically different from anything you ever imagined or considered. That's also possible. And number nine, following him may subject us to ridicule, persecution, derision, humiliation. Note in Mary's scenario, the Bible doesn't speak to any shame or humiliation she suffered. But in her time, being pregnant while betrothed was horrible. I mean, people would think, well, there's only way that happened, one way that happened, and you're, you're in big trouble with all of us. But there's no evidence that that's what happened to Mary. And the overshadowing or the overwatch took care of Mary and it'll take care of us. It will take care of us. And then last year, faith in he who leads us is how we move forward. Faith is the key. Faith is so important. Hebrews 1 speaks to it. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Hope for, this isn't knock on wood, cross your fingers. Oh, I hope, I hope, I hope. It's not like that. It's like if your birthday's Tuesday, the party's arranged, everybody's coming. You're filled with hope for how it will all be. But you know it's coming. So faith is assurance, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Then Paul says it a little differently. Romans chapter 10. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard to the word of Christ. You're hearing me now. Those of you online are hearing me now. And we have the opportunity now with the world of media and technology to hear great teaching all the time. You can hear him through worship music. You hear him through prayer, through what others share with you in group and fellowship. 
But he's also referring to, and we know, this is God's word. We trust it to be his word. For us now, we have this opportunity to be in his word, hearing the message constantly, lest we forget. And remember what Chadwick said. I quoted him a little bit earlier. Confusion and impotence are the inevitable results when the wisdom and the resources of the world are substituted for the presence and power of the Spirit. And what came to me when I considered this quote from him was back in the day as a kid, hundreds of years ago, I lived in a suburb of East Los Angeles. And what was typically done then, on the weekends especially, was, all right, go outside and play. Come in when the streetlights come on. Anybody know that experience? There's always a few. I loved it. And we always stayed longer than when the streetlights came on because then you could play better hide and seek. <laughs> but you know what it made me think of when I was thinking about hearing the message? Say that I'm under a streetlight and I'm reading God's word. I can see it. I can see it clear as day. It's like it's beautiful. But say it for some reason, I get pulled or drawn or somehow end up moving a little bit over here. Now it's like I can't, can't quite, this is hard to, and what if I go a little bit further and I'm over here? I can't see it at all anymore. Now I have a choice to make. And the choice may be, oh, why bother? I'll just, I'll get to it later, another time. I just, it's too frustrating, I don't want to do it. Or I can choose to get back under the light where I can see everything. I would encourage you to choose the light. So what is our next bold step? We hear this teaching, what we're hearing about igniting and launching in this new direction to, to follow the Lord in discipleship and learn, follow Jesus. Let me tell you about Jeff and Julie. These are people dear to my wife and I. Many, many years ago, Jeff and Julie met in Central America. They were missionary kids, two missionary families. And they learned to speak Spanish and were in that missionary family world and lifestyle. But they met and fell in love, got married pretty quickly, and ended up, they had dual citizenship, going back to the U.S. Because they had a dream. Jeff was skilled in technical things and construction and he signed up to get a degree in construction supervision from the University of Colorado. So they moved there. And while they were there, they got very involved in the New Life Church in Colorado, which is huge. Very involved. Knew hundreds of people. And as they get closer to Jeff graduating and getting his degree, they're doing what I surmise that Mary and Joseph did. They're planning. They're planning their life. Okay, where do you want to live after this? And Gosh, we got five contacts with companies. It's all going to go great. And then, you know, I can help with the house if it's an older one and fix her up, or I can help remodel it. Jeff has skills. And they also had their first two kids, twins, a girl and a boy, Gabriella and Michael. Gabriella was born with genetic problems. She still is like this today, and her mind isn't fully developed and all of that. And they were told by the doctors right away, you know, just getting you ready for it. She's not going to last. It's not going to work. She won't live. And they said, that's not what we're hearing from God. We don't believe that. Now, you could say, well, all parents think that, but they really felt like, no, it doesn't fit. So as they get ready to graduate and move on with their life, Jeff gets a phone call. And the phone calls from a church member in La Seba, Honduras. And he tells Jeff, your father was killed in a plane crash. His father was a, a missionary who started five churches in La Ceiba, but also flew top fixed-wing aircraft, and he would have a PA system and f fly slow over villages and share gospel messages and then throw leaflets out. And he crashed during one of those flights. And Jeff said, oh, man, I'm devastated. You know, thanks for telling me. He goes, well, there's another thing. You must come and take your father's position with the five churches because that's how it's done in that culture. It's simply how it's done. And he said, what? 
what are you talking about? We're building our life here. And he says, Senior Jeff, this is, this is it. So they hung up and said they'd pray about it. So again, it's cognitive dissonance. What? Right before the, right before the phone call, we knew exactly what was happening. And the call changed everything. And two weeks later, they had prayed and the Lord told them to go. They're also taking their daughter with them, who is pronounced not going to make it. So they went to La Seba and Jeff stepped in and helped stabilize those five churches. And they found great care for their daughter, who's with us today. And after a couple of years, they, they were just praying and God gave them another message that came out of nowhere said, you're supposed to stop doing the church thing. You've set it up. It's stable. It's going well. And you need to do this other mission I'm calling you to. And that mission was to address the needs of those people so impoverished, outskirts of the city, along rivers and in the jungle, who had no way to organize, no way to be together, no way to gather and have church, no way to gather and have school, nothing. And they clearly heard the message, you're supposed to go and do that. And they said, Okay, that ministry thrives to this day. So fast forward a little bit later, I'm in El Salvador on a Compassion Vision tour with one of our pastors, and that pastor says, you know, I know this couple, I knew them from Colorado, they have a mission in Honduras, you want to pop over and see them? I said, sure, I'm game. So we did. It was great getting to know Jeff and Julie a bit, and then we came home. A year or two later, we get asked to go uh, down to El Salvador to deal with or to visit Compassion Kids that are being sponsored here. And on this trip, Pastor Kevin comes. He's there also to, to, to do an all-day organic outreach training for pastors from all over the region. And when we were done with that, we said, well, why don't we just go over and see Jeff and Julie and see if that's something Shoreline ought to do. So we did that, and we got to know them. We spent an entire day on a dock by the ocean talking about them as a couple, them as a family, their friend, their friend community and their engagement in church and how the mission was going. And at times, and I was part of this, we gently confronted him. We said, I'm not, I don't feel good about what you're doing here and I think you need to do more there for your marriage and your family. I'm sorry, but I have to tell you. And they were hurt. She even cried some and I said, what's that about? And she said, missionaries come down here and do great stuff with us all the time and you're here and you're giving us advice, but then you go away. We never see you or hear from you again. She goes, I'm just tired of it. I said, wow, duly noted. I took that in. So we come back. I'm here in Monterey. I get an email from Jeff out of the blue. He goes, D, I'm coming to Monterey. I'd like to spend a couple of days with you. I said, yeah, I'm all about that because I know the missionary deal. When you're out in the field, you come back and visit the church that sent you every year and you both report all the good and wonderful things you're doing and ensure the ongoing flow of your support. I know that. So I was ready. I told oh, Jeff once. He said, I want to ask you something when I get there. I said, fine. So I'm ready to write him a check. On day two before he goes, he goes, can we talk tonight? I said, yeah. Oh, you had a question? He goes, yeah. We, he, talk about cognitive dissonance. He said, would you pastor Julie and I? I was like dumbfounded. What did you say? I don't... I don't even understand. I waited a few minutes. I said, okay, tell me more. He said, I was viewed as a pastor in La Ceiba, over five churches that are ongoing that my father settled. I cannot be pastored in La Ceiba. If I went to a well-known pastor, he would say, no, Senior Jeff, it is you who should pastor me. It's the culture. He couldn't be pastored there. He said, would you pastor? And I said, well, this is, this is wacky. I don't even know how this would work. Prayed about it. A couple weeks later, I said, Yes. I've had a scheduled call with Jeff and Julie at five o'clock every Sunday for eight years, and I'll talk to them today at five o'clock. We don't always make all the calls. I never expected that, never planned it. I thought I knew what was going on, and then he asked me a question that changed, what? Opened a whole new door into a whole new world, you know? Kind of launched me into thinking about them in Honduras. And then a year or so after that, he, uh, we we're one of our calls, he goes, I think you're supposed to come down here, you and Heather, and do a marriage retreat. I said, I'm sorry. Perhaps you know that I'm not an author. I've, I haven't done a retreat in 20 years, and so you must have the wrong dentist. I'm stunned. I'm like, what are you saying? 
what? I'll pray about it again. Within two weeks, I said, all right, all right. But I don't know anything about what you're talking about. I took a year and asked him hundreds of questions. I said, tell me what you mean and what you want. So again, it was cognitive dissonance in both cases. Pastor you, what? And come down there and do retreats for married missionary leaders in that area of Honduras? We just finished last summer our seventh marriage retreat down there. And we'll go again. We'll go till they, till they don't ask us. But I can tell you, right before pastoring them, right before going down there, there was nothing in my mind or my plan that, was, that would consider either one of those options. None. So here, here's, a, here's a key. What's the greatest ability in the world of sports? What's the greatest ability in the world of sports? Availability. That's a little trick thing. First, first service, people shouted it out. This, you guys didn't know. Huh? But all I was was available. That's it. Available. Starts there. I had no call to either one of the things we do in Honduras a minute before the call came. No thought, no nothing. So Jeff and Julie took their bold steps. I've taken mine. Heather and I have taken ours together. There's more. I mean, we're here. There's more to do. What are your next bold steps? What are yours going to be? And maybe it's something small and easy to do, and you're already doing it. Hallelujah. But maybe it's something else, bigger, and maybe different from what you ever thought. Please pray and consider it. Be available to consider it. Because, again, we're always free to say no. We're always free to choose. That's the only way love works and submission and trust works is when you're free to not do those things. So I would encourage you. Our mission is to pray and grow in following Jesus no matter what the conditions, no matter what the events, no matter what our temperament, like Peter's. We are to follow Jesus and continue discipleship no matter what. Even in our confusion, as Mary did. I'm going to lead us in prayer now. And the first part of this prayer is going to be quiet. I'm just going to ask you to search your hearts. Lord, is there something you want to say to me about something you want me to do? If so, please make it known to me. However it works between you and him, would you join me? Lord, speak to every person here and every person watching online. Let them know what you want from them and what you have for them. Precious Lord, for what you're communicating right now to each of us here and online. Thank you for what you just communicated to me. Father, what, what I heard you clearly inspire in my thinking was, if we're still here, we're not done. And Father, I, my commitment is to remain available. I pray that for everyone here, whether it's just reaffirming what they're already doing or if it's some something new, a, a next step for them to ignite and be launched. I pray you would tell them, Father, and then tell them how to proceed, how to respond and move forward. I pray these things. I thank you for all these wonderful brothers and sisters and entrust them to your care. All in the name of Jesus. Everyone together said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Dad. As Pastor Dennis was speaking, maybe in, inside you, you were 
remembering or thinking through or are just now experiencing one of those kind of blindside events that have kind of taken you off track and you're not exactly sure where to go from here. You saw a list earlier of some of our care ministries. We've got divorce care and grief share and lay counseling and celebrate recovery and so much more. And they're all represented out in our courtyard. We would love to have you go out there. If you're in need of having someone come alongside you and meet you in a difficult spot where you are, we want to come alongside you. We want to be there for you. So please don't leave here without stopping by those booths. We're also going to have people up here to pray for you. If immediately right now you're saying, I just need prayer for this thing that I'm going through, please don't don't leave here without getting that prayer. Come here, share with someone else, let them present that to God on your behalf. And maybe it's a combination of the both. And also, if you are feeling like maybe that next bold step is, is doing something more in serving, we'd invite you as well to go by those booths out there. Maybe... Maybe you're going to join the jail ministry and start ministering to people there. Maybe you've got something to offer in one of the other areas, but we would love to have you be equipped. And today could be the day that you step up and you say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to follow through with that. Um, If you've never been by our Connection Center, we invite you to do so, to stop by our Connection Center. If you're here on campus, we want you to be part of the church. And being part of the church is in some way coming here on Sunday mornings, but in so much greater way. It's being in the fabric of the church. It's being involved in our groups, in our Bible studies, serving in ministry. And we would love to have you be part of that. If you're online, you can text the word welcome to the number on your screen. But if you're here, please stop by the Connection Center. Give them some information. They'll give you some information. They have a gift for you. They would love to have you be more part of what's going on here. And I did forget one thing. If you're at home and you need prayer, there's a number on your screen there that you also can dial. And we've got a team there that would love to pray for you. We always love to send people off with a word of blessing. So if you would indulge me, if you could stand, I would love to send you off with with God's blessing on your life so that as you walk out of here, you walk out with him. In light of what Pastor Dennis shared, that sometimes we are going to be caught off guard Maybe God's going to call us in a different direction. It is my prayer that each of you would have eyes to see what God is calling you to. Whether it be a new area of ministry, reaching out to a neighbor, someone at work, or just making yourself available. Walk in the confidence that God will equip you if you make yourself available. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.